Hello dear students, welcome to the lecture 8 of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning course. Uh, so the topic of uh, today's lecture is feature selection. So features. You see these are the features uh, of our uh, whether to go for a ride or not, uh, when terrain, unicycle type and weather conditions are uh, combined. And where do they come from? Okay. This is a good question. Where do features come from? Actually, uh, we decide features uh, what to be based on our problem. This is the hardest part of machine learning or one of the hardest parts. Perhaps the hardest part, I am not sure. Uh, and the important part. Because there are many good algorithms that can um, solve your problem However, if you don't uh, pick your features, generate your feature set uh, good enough, uh, no matter what algorithm you use, you will likely to fail. Okay, so this is a really important uh, part of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So uh, try to uh, understand uh, this lecture as much as uh, possible. So uh, there are some machine learning repositories. You can also use uh, the data sets uh, in these repositories in your project if you want. However, what I want is for the projects is um, you have to generate your features yourself from rave, rave data, uh, from unprocessed data. I want you to generate your features yourself. This is a mandatory uh, condition of projects uh, because without if you don't also generate the features at yourself you can just find uh, some ready algorithm on the internet and apply it, it it to the ready data set and just obtain the result this is not what we want uh, i want you to understand how machine learning works uh, how to solve uh, new problems that you may encounter in your professional life in your future life therefore uh, at least generating features yourself uh, will tremendously uh, make you understand how machine learning works okay so provided features predicting the age of abalone from physical measurements okay uh, so Abalone have many, uh, let's say, different uh, aspects and perhaps properties and features. However, for our task, which is uh, determining uh, the, I think, age of abalone. So to be able to determine the age, we have to pick the best features that will uh both generate high success rate on the training set and that will be uh let's say uh, generalize it enough uh to uh predict the future predict the unknown unseen abolinies ages of unseen abolinies okay so these are the uh features of the researchers uh, the researchers took these features to uh, train their uh, machine learning model and predict the unknown uh, unseen abolinies, ages of the unseen abolinies. So let's check them. So the feature sex is nominal, which means it gets either one of these categories, which are male, female, and infant. So uh, this, the uh, sex attribute of the abalone can be three different categories. So the length attribute of the abalone is continuous. Therefore, uh, it is described in millimeters and it is uh, calculated as longest shell measurement. So there is diameter uh, uh, feature of the abalone. 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 Okay, abalone, and it is also continuous in millimeters perpendicular to the length. There is height attribute uh, 
features of uh, abalene it is continuous millimeters with meat in shell there is whole he whole weight continuous it is in grams shocked weight continuous it is in grams and with carrot weight continuous it is in grams uh, shell weight continuous it is in grams and rings integer uh, value okay so what continuous means that uh, it can have floating it, it they are floating uh, numbers okay floating let me check what was how was it how it was uh, explained okay floating point arithmetic Okay. Okay, anyway, so uh, continuous are floating point numbers and others are integers. Okay. So um, you see these were the features uh, that were uh, decided to be useful in decide predicting predicting the age of abalene from physical measurements when you get uh, such a task you have to decide which features are useful uh, to achieve your uh, task okay so when predicting breast cancer recurrence uh, they have used H. You see, this is also, uh, I think, nominal because it is categorized, as you can see. And by the way, I was going to tell that you cannot compare grams and millimeters. That is, uh, in machine learning, only the same feature, same attribute can be compared. Okay, that is the, why we generate... Uh, uh, feature arrays and compare always the same indexed uh, feature uh, among different arrays what i mean is uh, if you open the abalone uh, data okay, i will uh, download it again so here okay so uh, these are the uh, features of each abalene okay and you see these are the re uh, vectoral representation of features okay so you see uh, when you provide features to your algorithm if that feature is let's say um, let me open the index of names here okay and okay for example uh, rings okay let's compare rings uh, rings are the integers which are provided at the last i think you see missing attribute values and there is classes and let's say there is a abalene which has no rings okay here you don't make the feature array like this you write there zero or let's say there is an abalene uh, which uh, lacks of the uh, calculation of whole weight for example okay uh, you don't you don't just delete it like this you provide zero to that unless uh, if your algorithm is uh, when no data is provided if it is uh, putting there zero because if there is no value here 
uh, what will you with uh, compare it k and therefore you should also normalize each uh, data uh, within itself each attribute feature within itself what i mean is uh, i think we have shown it already but uh, I will just uh, repeat it uh, for you to remember. Okay, I am looking for a good example. Okay, I think this is a good article uh, for normalization. Uh, let's see if there is um, some numeric example as well. Okay, mean max normalization. Let's find a good example of it. I think that it is here. Yeah, okay. Let's read it. Min-max is a data normalization technique like z-score, decimal scaling, and normalization with standard deviation. It helps to normalize the data. It will scale the data between 0 and 1. This normalization helps us to understand the data easily. For example, if I say you to tell me the difference between 200 and 1000 then it's a little bit confusing as compared to when I ask you to tell me the difference between 0 0.2 and 1. Okay, so the formula is so simple. Uh, it is like this. And if we normalize this data set, uh, it is normalized like this. So uh, V uh, subtract mean marks and let's see okay and so when you let's say normalizing the eight you subtract eight from the minimum of the array which is eight here eight uh, subtract eight and from uh, maximum to minimum you subtract using max or max mean max uh, 20 uh, subtract eight multiply with uh, new max uh, and new min which are new max and new min is the um, uh, range we are determining in in here we are determining the range as zero and one therefore it is new max uh, subtract new min which is making one uh, over there is uh, let's see you can make uh, something and plus new min and the new min is zero therefore the new value of the 8 is now 0. Okay. And when you apply this rule to everything, they become like this. 0, 0 0.16, 0 0.58 and 1. Okay. So this is the min-max normalization, which is very useful because many algorithms work with uh, calculating distances of uh, uh, each uh, object. Therefore, if one feature is having too much uh, weight difference, it may affect your overall performance. So the logical um, thing to do is min-max normalization. Okay. There is also z-score. Let's check. Let's see it as well. Z-score helps in the normalization of data. If we normalize the data into a simpler form with the help of z-score normalization, then it's very easy to understand by our brains. By the way, uh, it is not important for us to understand. It is more important 
for algorithms to perform better. However, if you can understand uh, better, uh, you may also develop a, let's say, better algorithm or uh, methodology. So it is uh, the Z score equal to X minus uh, mean uh, over uh, standard deviation. So for this uh, data set, it is calculated like this, as you can see, 8 minus uh, 13.25 which is the mean as you can see it is calculated here yeah this is a pretty small um, small image and you uh, sum all of them and uh, make average of them like this uh, so the z score normalization standard deviation is uh, this and then we apply the rule x minus uh, standard deviation over uh, this i mean mean over this and they become like this you see they are between minus two and uh, two this is another uh, scoring this can also work but uh, you have to be sure that your algorithm works with um, every kind of double value some algorithms doesn't work with uh, negative values uh, some algorithm works so uh, you can all you should also test your data set performance between different normalization methods okay not just stick to one normalization try different normalizations uh, in your uh, particular case z score may perform better than uh, mean max there is also decimal scaling let's check it out as well anyway okay it is like this okay there is not a good example for this and there is standard deviation normalization Okay, we get this and then what we do? Anyway, I suggest you to try uh, Z-score or min max and if either of them works better, you can uh, choose the better one. Anyway, let's continue and uh, provided features. I will also look for... Okay, I think this is a good example. Okay, here. Introduction to Feature Scaling I was recently working with a dataset that had multiple features spanning varying degrees of magnitude, range, and units. This is a significant obstacle as a few machine learning algorithms are highly sensitive to these features. Okay, let's read this again. This is a significant obstacle as a few machine learning algorithms are highly sensitive to these features. Okay, and
Okay, sorry about the delay. Let's continue. I'm sure most of you must have faced this issue in your projects or your learning journey. For example, one feature is entirely in kilograms while the other is in grams, another one is liters, and so on. How can we use these features when they vary so vastly in terms of what they're presenting? This is where I turn to the concept of feature scaling. It's a crucial part of the data preprocessing stage but I've seen a lot of beginners overlook it to the detriment of their machine learning model. Here's the curious thing about feature scaling, it improves significantly the performance of some machine learning algorithms and does not work at all for others. What could be the reason behind this quirk? Also, what's the difference between normalization and standardization? These are two of the most commonly used feature scaling techniques in machine learning but a level of ambiguity exists in their understanding. When should you use which technique? I will answer these questions and more in this article on feature scaling. We will also implement feature scaling in Python to give you a practice understanding of how it works for different machine learning algorithms. Okay, so. Why should we use feature scaling? The first question we need to address, why do we need to scale the variables in our data set? Some machine learning algorithms are sensitive to feature scaling while others are virtually invariant to it. Let me explain that in more detail. Okay, this is what I mean. Depending on your algorithm, uh, feature scaling may uh, impact your performance significantly. Gradient descent based algorithms. Machine learning algorithms like linear regression, logistic regression, neural network, etc. that use gradient descent as an optimization technique require data to be scaled. Take a look at the formula for gradient descent below. The presence of feature value x in the formula will affect the step size of the gradient descent. The difference in ranges of features will cause different step sizes for each feature. To ensure that the gradient descent moves smoothly towards the minima and that the steps for gradient descent are updated at the same rate for all the features, we scale the data before feeding it to the model. So what is the gradient descent? Uh, I think it is uh, something like this. There is a minima and maximum. You see like this. You can... Uh, look for it on the internet more if you want uh, it is another complex stuff uh, so i will just continue where was it okay where was our article Okay, here, sorry about that. Let's read this. Having features on a similar scale can help the gradient descent converge more quickly towards the minima. Okay, maybe we can find a video about this, maybe. Okay, let's show... You see, it is all about mathematics. I'm just trying to find a good example. We're going to solve the formula that we saw earlier, right? Okay, I think this is a good explanation. Gradient descent suppose we have a convex cost function of two input variables as shown above and our goal is to minimize its value and find the value of the parameters x, y for which f x, y is minimum. 
what the gradient descent algorithm does is, we start at a specific point on the curve and use the negative gradient to find the direction of steepest descent and take a small step in that direction and keep iterating till our value starts converging. Okay, I think this is a good article. So if you are more interested in it, you can read it. I will put it here. But this is the main idea. Uh, finding the minima. Okay, and... Okay. Okay, and other one. Distance-based algorithms. Distance algorithms like KNN, K-means, and SVM are most affected by the range of features. This is because behind the scenes they are using distances between data points to determine their similarity. For example, let's say we have data containing high school CGPA scores of students ranging from 0 to 5 and their future incomes in thousands rupees. Since both the features have different scales, there is a chance that higher weightage is given to features with higher magnitude. This will impact the performance of the machine learning algorithm and obviously, we do not want our algorithm to be biased towards one feature. Therefore, we scale our data before employing a distance-based algorithm so that all the features contribute equally to the result. Okay, this is so true. This is what you need to do. Uh, if you just use them without scaling, uh, the salary feature would overwhelm the other feature because it would be thousands, thousands of times bigger, uh, for example. The effect of scaling is conspicuous when we compare the Euclidean distance between data points for students A and B, and between B and C, before and after scaling as shown below. Okay, so this is the before scaling. You see it is 20. Distance uh, BC before scaling 1. Uh, distance AB after scaling 2.6. And distance BC after scaling 1.59. You see, uh, before scaling and after scaling makes uh, like 20 times difference because of the uh, different uh, uh, value types of the uh, features. Scaling has brought both the features into the picture and the distances are now more comparable than they were before we applied scaling. Tree-based algorithms Tree-based algorithms, on the other hand, are fairly insensitive to the scale of the features. Think about it, a decision tree is only splitting a node based on a single feature. The decision tree splits a node on a feature that increases the homogeneity of the node. This split on a feature is not influenced by other features. So, there is virtually no effect of the remaining features on the split. This is what makes them invariant to the scale of the features. This is true if you are using a decision tree based algorithm, you don't need to do scaling because it is not uh, about uh, calculating uh, numerics of uh, features. What is normalization? Normalization is a scaling technique in which values are shifted and rescaled so that they end up ranging between 0 and 1. It is also known as min-max scaling. Oh, one moment. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, I'll repeat again. Normalization is a scaling technique in which values are shifted and rescaled so that they end up ranging between 0 and 1. It is also known as min-max scaling. Okay, we have seen this. What is standardization? Standardization is another scaling technique where the values are centered around the mean with a unit standard deviation. This means that the mean of the attribute becomes zero and the resultant distribution has a unit standard deviation.
Now, the big question in your mind must be when should we use normalization and when should we use standardization? Let's find out. Normalization versus standardization is an eternal question among machine learning newcomers. Let me elaborate on the answer in this section. Normalization is good to use when you know that the distribution of your data does not follow a Gaussian distribution. This can be useful in algorithms that do not assume any distribution of the data like k nearest neighbors and neural networks. Standardization, on the other hand, can be helpful in cases where the data follows a Gaussian distribution. However, this does not have to be necessarily true. Also, unlike normalization, standardization does not have a bounding range. So, even if you have outliers in your data, they will not be affected by standardization. So, if you wonder what is the Gaussian distribution, it is uh, like this. Okay. Or here, shape of normal distribution. However, at the end of the day, the choice of using normalization or standardization will depend on your problem and the machine learning algorithm you are using. There is no hard and fast rule to tell you when to normalize or standardize your data. You can always start by fitting your model to raw, normalized and standardized data and compare the performance for best results. Okay, let's repeat this again. You can always start by fitting your model to raw, normalized and standardized data and compare the performance for best results. Uh, please, uh, in your project also apply this rule so we can compare, compare it, uh, how it performs based on real data or normalized or standardized data. It is a good practice to fit the scalar on the training data and then use it to transform the testing data. This would avoid any data leakage during the model testing process. Also, the scaling of target values is generally not required. Okay, he shows um, future scaling in Python, in sklearn, sklearn, and okay, these are not what we needed. Let's continue. So now you get the idea idea of uh, normalization and uh, scaling uh, and uh, standardization. So uh, this is another uh, feature selection set of breast cancer recurrence. So there is class which we are which we want to uh, predict for uh, NIF. Uh, instances new cases uh, the features are age menopause tumor size you see uh, the researchers here categorized all the integer values okay like this this is split into categories this is split into categories and invasive nodes split into categories uh, node cups yes no uh, malignancy uh, category, uh, left right category. Okay, so they have uh, made all the values into categories which is nominal. Okay, okay. Okay, anyway, let's continue. Provided features. In many physical domains, e.g., biology, medicine, chemistry, engineering, etc., the data has been collected and the relevant features identified. We cannot collect more features from the examples, at least, core features. 
In these domains, we can often just use the provided features. Why do you think this is th this way? Uh, because in these areas, experts are collecting and generating the data. We are just doing machine learning on them. For example, can you, as a software engineer or, or developer, can you collect data from uh, viruses or from uh, uh, brain cells and such? It is uh, extremely delicate and professionality requiring areas and only probably only uh, uh, medical experts can do them uh, therefore in these areas usually they are collected raw data versus features in many other domains we are provided with the raw data but must extract identify features okay other domains such as all are uh, usually digital domains, image data, text data, audio data, log data, and you see these are all digital data where feature selection, feature extraction, and uh, feature optimization are all up to us. Okay, we are the expert in these areas usually. Text, raw data. Okay, so the text itself is real data and how do we get the features of text data to um, process it for example Clinton said banana repeatedly last week on TV banana 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 this is our sentence and we want to compose feature set of this the occurrence of words could be um, uh, written like this banana Clinton said California zero you see, there is California across and wrong capital. These are also added to the future set, future vector. However, they are zero. Why? Because when you process, when you work on um, text-based data, uh, all of the uh, documents uh, could only be compared when you compose a dictionary of words that exist in uh, every one of the documents therefore in every one of your uh, feature vector have to have have to have all of the uh, words in your document collection so that each document same feature can be compared in text uh, in machine learning when you are working with text each keyword is usually uh, used as a feature each unique keyword there is also some other cases such as each two letters each two characters or each two words or such uh, however usually each word itself a uh, unique word is a unique uh, uh, word itself as a feature so if we use the frequency of word recurrence as a feature value they become like this okay this is important do we retain all the information in the original document of course not because in the original document where the words are positioned is also important so we can use occurrence of biograms uh, bigrams i mean uh, here we are using just uh, monograms and here we are using bigrams which are Banana repeatedly, Clinton said, uh, said banana, you see, now uh, they are becoming two words. Okay, so here we are also keeping uh, the, at least a degree, the positions of uh, words. And what about other features? Okay, let's continue. Lots of other features what are they if you wonder pos part of speech occurrence counts sequence identification as nouns verbs adjectives adverbs so this is important post tagging uh, let's find a good example okay so you see that parts of speech noun the dog adverb the dog how it loudly pronoun it work preposition so these are part of speech tags 
So there is no one like this. Constituents. So what is constituents? Okay, dependency grammar analysis of constituent structure grounds could put off the custom. Okay, you see there is dependency grammar analysis in uh, text classification or text based uh, clustering. You can use all these attributes. These are all attributes and features of a uh, text document. Okay. Whether V1 Agra occurred 15 times. Whether banana occurred more times than apple. If the document has a number in it. Features are very important, but we're going to focus on the models today. So these are the features. Uh, if you work uh, with a feature-based uh, machine learning, let's say, such as uh, classification of uh, the user reviews uh, posted on EMDB database, uh, you can look for more future selection, future extraction of text-based uh, data sets. How, how will you search? You will search like this. Mm. Let's say. Okay. Mm. Okay, someone has already written. Okay. Okay, there is text preprocessing, removing text, removing accented. Uh, as extended characters, expanding con uh, contradictions, removing special characters. These are all text processing, um, let's say, stages. These are all really important. Stemming and lemmatization, removing stop words, clean the data, and then back of Morse model. This is also important. And back of engrams model. You have to generate your future model. You see, it is becoming like this because you have to uh, uh, put every one of the words in your each uh, feature array e, uh, for each document or whatever you are comparing, such as if you are comparing um, IMDB uh, reviews, like of TFID model. If you work with uh, text classification, you have to use this. This is one of the most, um, let's say, successful model generating in text-based uh, modeling, document similarity, and document clustering with same uh, similarity features. And you see, this is a really good written article. I'm going to add this to our um, let's say uh, slides as well okay here okay traditional materials so Text plus processing. Okay, and what are there? Uh, let's write them as well. Okay, removing tax.
the bag of force model this is also really important and of engrams model this is another uh, modeling i have worked with all of these models and things in my both in my uh, um, master thesis and phd thesis so these are really um, popular and uh, common uh, techniques approaches methods and such okay this is enough i think that's clear this okay so if you want to work uh, with a text-based project you should really read this uh, article uh, to the fully to the fullest or perhaps to say okay this is a hyperlink Okay, now it should be more clear. Okay, let's make um, English. Uh, it's not important. Okay, let's continue. How is an image represented? By the way, maybe we should read some of these as well uh, before we move into image representation. It is long, but we may read first sentences. Text pre-processing. There can be multiple ways of cleaning and pre-processing textual data. In the following points, we highlight some of the most important ones which are used heavily in natural language processing NLP pipelines. Removing tags, our text often contains unnecessary content like HTML tags, which do not add much value when analyzing text. The beautiful soup library does an excellent job in providing necessary functions for this. Removing accented characters, in any text corpus, especially if you are dealing with the English language, often you might be dealing with accented characters, letters. Hence we need to make sure that these characters are converted and standardized into ASCII characters. A simple example would be converting A to E. I think uh, this can be also given as example. In Turkish, uh, we can say it can be like as... Uh, let's say these two. This I wonder how I want to read it. A simple example would be converting G to G. Well, okay, it is read it uh, read as G. However, this is G in Turkish and to G. Okay, in Turkish especially, uh, this may be very useful for you. Expanding contractions. In the English language, contractions are basically shortened versions of words or syllables. These shortened versions of existing words or phrases are created by removing specific letters and sounds. Examples would be, do not to don't and I would to I'd. Converting each contraction to its expanded, original form often helps with text standardization. Okay, you see this is part of text standardization. Removing special characters, special characters and symbols which are usually non-alphanumeric characters often add to the extra noise in unstructured text. More than often, simple regular expressions regexes, can be used to achieve this. Stemming and lemmatization, word stems are usually the base form of possible words that can be created by attaching affixes like prefixes and suffixes to the stem to create new words. This is known as inflection. The reverse process of obtaining the base form of a word is known as stemming. A simple example are the words watches, watching, and watched. They have the word root stem watch as the base form. Lemmatization is very similar to stemming, where we remove word affixes to get to the base form of a word. However the base form in this case is known as the root word but not the root stem. 
the difference being that the root word is always a lexicographically correct word, present in the dictionary, but the root stem may not be so. By the way, uh, it, it is not necessarily these processes will uh, improve your uh, success rate. It, it will usually, however, depending on your um, uh, machine learning algorithm and your, um, uh, let's say, project, uh, the thing you are trying to solve, they may also reduce your performance. Therefore, you have to test uh, your project with applying these methods, these standardizations, and without applying them. Okay. Removing stop words, words which have little or no significance especially when constructing meaningful features from text are known as stop words or stop words. These are usually words that end up having the maximum frequency if you do a simple term or word frequency in a corpus. Words like a, an, the, and so on are considered to be stop words. There is no universal stop word list but we use a standard English language stop words list from NLTK. You can also add your own domain specific stop words as needed. Besides this, you can also do other standard operations like tokenization, removing extra white spaces, text lower casing, and more advanced operations like spelling corrections, grammatical error corrections, removing repeated characters, and so on. If you are interested, you can check out a sample notebook on text pre processing from one of my recent books. Okay, anyway, let's continue. Okay. In this article, this uh, person, this developer is building a simple um, text preprocessor. I will just continue because we just need to understand the uh, technique. Bag of words model. This is one of the most used model for uh, text processing. This is perhaps the most simple vector space representational model for unstructured text. A vector space model is simply a mathematical model to represent unstructured text or any other data as numeric vectors, such that each dimension of the vector is a specific feature attribute. The bag of words model represents each text document as a numeric vector where each dimension is a specific word from the corpus and the value could be its frequency in the document, occurrence denoted by 1 or 0, or even weighted values. The model's name is such because each document is represented literally as a bag of its own words, disregarding word orders, sequences, and grammar. Okay, let's read this again because uh, this includes some very important things such as this is actually a vector space model is simply a mathematical model to represent unstructured text or any other data as numeric vectors such that each dimension of the vector is a specific feature attribute you see this is actually what we are doing we are converting our objects into the vector space model with mathematical uh, representation numeric vectors we do that for uh, uh, Concert determination or for uh, predicting the uh, age of uh, the uh, uh, what were they called as age of the uh, avalons or such. We all represent these as uh, numeric vectors. For example, here you see this is vectorial representation of that um, instance. Okay. We also convert this into the vectoral representation, such as males are 0, females are 1, and in infants are 0 0.5, or whatever you choose. Okay. Uh, so we do this the same for uh, uh, text processing as well, such as this one. Uh, this is the vectoral representation of, for example, this which are bacon, beans, beautiful. So in the first document, there is no bacon, there is no beans, there is beautiful, therefore it is one. There is blue one. However, they have uh, the, uh, let's say, frequency of one. For example, in document six, uh, the sky word has two times. Uh, 
uh, two frequency two. Therefore, it is written as two. So this is a simple uh, bag of words representation of documents. And okay, okay let's read this. Thus you can see that our documents have been converted into numeric vectors such that each document is represented by one vector, row, in the above feature matrix. The following code will help represent this in a more easy to understand format. Okay, you see this is a feature matrix, so each feature set, each uh, vector is uh, representing a document here. This is document 0, this is document 1. So this is a jagged array, okay, or array of arrays, okay. Uh, you see, these each of these are representing a document with frequency of words. This is the simplest way, and this will not, uh, uh, this will, this will not uh, uh, generate or result in high performance, high accuracy. But this is for you to get the idea. This should make things more clearer. You can clearly see that each column or dimension in the feature vectors represents a word from the corpus and each row represents one of our documents. The value in any cell represents the number of times that word represented by column occurs in the specific document represented by row. Hence if a corpus of documents consists of n unique words across all the documents, we would have an n-dimensional vector for each of the documents. So each row is representing a document in a text classification and each column representing a feature, a word in text classification. It is same for other uh, data sets as well. For example, in here, each row is representing a uh, abalon and each column representing a feature of abalon such as sex, length, diameter, height, here, sex, length, diameter, and height, and their values are actually different. For example, sex is nominal, length is millimeter, diameter millimeter, height millimeter, however, whole weight is grams. Uh, therefore, you also need to scale the data as we have seen. So, this is how you represent real objects uh, in mathematical vectors to apply your um, machine learning algorithms okay this is the usually the case how machine learning algorithms works okay it is safe and in text classification they are converted like this so simple actually if you uh, understand the basic concept bag of n grams model A word is just a single token, often known as a unigram or one gram. We already know that the bag of words model doesn't consider order of words. But what if we also wanted to take into account phrases or collection of words which occur in a sequence? N grams help us achieve that. An N gram is basically a collection of word tokens from a text document such that these tokens are contiguous and occur in a sequence. By grams indicate n grams of order 2, 2 words, tri grams indicate n grams of order 3, 3 words, and so on. The bag of n grams model is hence just an extension of the bag of words model so we can also leverage n gram based features. The following example depicts by gram based features in each document feature vector. Uh, one moment. Uh, okay, we continue. So, uh, you see this article is written by uh, uh, a really good uh, resume having uh, developers. Data science lead at Applied 4 Tech, at Google Developer Expert, Machine Learning, Author, Consultant, AI Advisor. Okay. Uh, so uh, we can use uh, bag of n words model as well. You see that time uh, the feature uh, set becomes like this. Bacon eggs, beautiful sky, beautiful today, blue beautiful, blue dog and such.
This gives us feature vectors for our documents, where each feature consists of a bi-gram representing a sequence of two words and values represent how many times the bi-gram was present for our documents. And the famous TF-IDF model, uh, if you work with uh, text documents, you must definitely use TF-IDF model for weighting, uh, to, for giving importance to each one of your uh, features, in this case uh, words, rather than just frequency like here. This is just rather raw frequency, which is not very uh, useful or logical. TF-IDF model. There are some potential problems which might arise with the bag of words model when it is used on large corpora. Since the feature vectors are based on absolute term frequencies, there might be some terms which occur frequently across all documents and these may tend to overshadow other terms in the feature set. The TF-IDF model tries to combat this issue by using a scaling or normalizing factor in its computation. TF-IDF stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency, which uses a combination of two metrics in its computation, namely, Term Frequency TF, and Inverse Document Frequency IDF. This technique was developed for ranking results for queries in search engines and now it is an indispensable model in the world of information retrieval and NLP. Let's read this again. This technique was developed for ranking results for queries in search engines and now it is an indispensable model in the world of information retrieval and NLP. Mathematically, we can define TFIDF as TFIDF equals TFXIDF, which can be expanded further to be represented as follows. It is actually a so simple algorithm. Uh, you just uh, multiply term frequency with inverse document frequency uh, i think there are even very good examples for this okay here Consider a document containing 100 words wherein the word cat appears three times. The term frequency, i.e., tf, for cat is then 3 one hundredths equals 0 0.03. Now, assume we have 10 million documents and the word cat appears in 1000 of these. Then, the inverse document frequency, i.e., idf, is calculated as log 10 million one thousandths equals 4. Thus, the TFIDF weight is the product of these quantities, 0.03 asterisk 4 equals 0.12. Okay, this value uh, is for uh, that uh, keyword in that particular document. So the TFIDF is calculated for each uh, document, for each keyword in that document uh, uh, respectively because the TF changes. IDF is same for all uh documents for that particular keyword you can uh, read more about tfidf on this website i think it's pretty cool they have made it anyway it's so simple if you want to learn so when we calculate the tfidf values you see our uh, vector set is becoming like this so now you see they have values between zero and probably one Okay. The TFIDF based feature vectors for each of our text documents show scaled and normalized values as compared to the raw bag of words model values. Interested readers who might want to dive into further details of how the internals of this model work can refer to page 181 of Text Analytics with Python, Springer, APRES, Depanjan Sarkar, 2016. Okay. Document similarity. Document similarity is the process of using a distance or similarity based metric that can be used to identify how similar a text document is with any other documents based on features extracted from the documents like bag of words or TFIDF. 
Okay, after we have calculated, the, after we have generated the uh, feature vectors of documents, then we can calculate their uh, similarity. Thus, you can see that we can build on top of the TFIDF based features we engineered in the previous section and use them to generate new features which can be useful in domains like search engines, document clustering, and information retrieval by leveraging these similarity based features. Pairwise document similarity in a corpus involves computing document similarity for each pair of documents in a corpus. Thus if you have C documents in a corpus, you would end up with a CXC matrix such that each row and column represents the similarity score for a pair of documents, which represent the indices at the row and column, respectively. There are several similarity and distance metrics that are used to compute document similarity. These include cosine distance, similarity, Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, BM25 similarity, Jacquard distance and so on. In our analysis, we will be using perhaps the most popular and widely used similarity metric, cosine similarity and compare pairwise document similarity based on their TFIDF feature vectors. Okay, this is uh, actually so easy once you have uh, generated TFIDF, you just uh, compare each feature with uh, the same feature in another document and let's say if uh, both values are one in each document, then you get zero uh, distance and you get one, pers one similarity. Cosine similarity basically gives us a metric representing the cosine of the angle between the feature vector representations of two text documents. Lower the angle between the documents, the closer and more similar they are as depicted in the following figure. Okay, anyway, uh, there is also document clustering. Uh, Okay, let's continue to read because these are important. Looking closely at the similarity matrix clearly tells us that documents 0, 1 and 6, 2, 5 and 7 are very similar to one another and documents 3 and 4 are slightly similar to each other but the magnitude is not very strong, however still stronger than the other documents. This must indicate these similar documents have some similar features. This is a perfect example of grouping or clustering that can be solved by unsupervised learning especially when you are dealing with huge corpora of millions of text documents. Document clustering with similarity features. Clustering leverages unsupervised learning to group data points documents in this scenario into groups or clusters. We will be leveraging an unsupervised hierarchical clustering algorithm here to try and group similar documents from our toy corpus together by leveraging the document similarity features we generated earlier. There are two types of hierarchical clustering algorithms namely, agglomerative and divisive methods. We will be using an agglomerative clustering algorithm, which is hierarchical clustering using a bottom-up approach i.e. each observation or document starts in its own cluster and clusters are successively merged together using a distance metric which measures distances between data points and a linkage merge criterion. A sample depiction is shown in the following figure. You see, first uh, they are all individual clusters and they are merged based on their similarity and at one point you uh, stop the merging and you obtain the final clusters. The selection of the linkage criterion governs the merge strategy. Some examples of linkage criteria are ward, complete linkage, average linkage and so on. This criterion is very useful for choosing the pair of clusters individual documents at the lowest step and clusters in higher steps to merge at each step is based on the optimal value of an objective function. We choose the Ward's minimum variance method as our linkage criterion to minimize total within cluster variance. Hence, at each step, we find the pair of clusters that leads to minimum increase in total within cluster variance after merging. 
Since we already have our similarity features, let's build out the linkage matrix on our sample documents. Okay, document cluster 1, document cluster 2, distance, cluster size. As you merge, the cluster size increases. Also the distance. If you closely look at the linkage matrix, you can see that each step row of the linkage matrix tells us which data points or clusters were merged together. If you have n data points, the linkage matrix Z will be having a shape of n 1 x 4 where Z I will tell us which clusters were merged at step I. Each row has four elements. The first two elements are either data point identifiers or cluster labels. In the later parts of the matrix once multiple data points are merged, the third element is the cluster distance between the first two elements either data points or clusters, and the last element is the total number of elements data points in the cluster once the merge is complete. We recommend you refer to the SIPI documentation, which explains this in detail. Okay, for in this case, for example, first 2 and 7 merge it, then uh, 0 and 6 is merged, and 3 and 4 is merged, but uh, there are distances as you can see, then the, uh, with 2 and 7, uh, the 5 is merged, and with 1, uh, 0 and 6 is merged. You see, at the, finally, they are all merged. So, after certain distance you cut the merging and you would obtain 5 to 7 as a one cluster if you cut the merging at distance 1 and 1 0 6 as a cluster and 3 and 4 as a cluster we can see how each data point starts as an individual cluster and slowly starts getting merged with other data points to form clusters on a high level from the colors and the dendrogram, you can see that the model has correctly identified three major clusters if you consider a distance metric of around 1.0 or above, denoted by the dotted line. Leveraging this distance, we get our cluster labels. Okay, so we can see the cluster labels here. The sky blue and beautiful category weather cluster label 2. Love this blue and beautiful sky weather cluster label 2. The creep room fox jumps over the lazy dog animals cluster label 1. A king's breakfast has uh, sausages, ham, bacon, eggs, toast and beers, beans cluster label 0 category food. I love green eggs, ham, sausages and bacon food cluster label 0. You see they are all correctly clustered. If you had, uh, you can use this methodology for classification as well. You will train a model. Uh, based on uh, these uh, distances and then you would pre you can predict the uh, NIP uh, documents based on your trained model. Okay. Thus you can clearly see our algorithm has correctly identified the three distinct categories in our documents based on the cluster labels assigned to them. This should give you a good idea of how our TFIDF features were leveraged to build our similarity features which in turn helped in clustering our documents. You can actually use this pipeline in the future for clustering your own documents. Topic Models We can also use some summarization techniques to extract topic or concept-based features from text documents. The idea of topic models revolves around the process of extracting key themes or concepts from a corpus of documents which are represented as topics. Each topic can be represented as a bag or collection of words, terms from the document corpus. Together, these terms signify a specific topic, theme or a concept and each topic can be easily distinguished from other topics by virtue of the semantic meaning conveyed by these terms. However often you do end up with overlapping topics based on the data. These concepts can range from simple facts and statements to opinions and outlook. Topic models are extremely useful in summarizing large corpus of text documents to extract and depict key concepts. They are also useful in extracting features from text data that capture latent patterns in the data.
There are various techniques for topic modeling and most of them involve some form of matrix decomposition. Some techniques like latent semantic indexing LSI, use matrix decomposition operations, more specifically singular value decomposition. We will be using another technique is latent Dirichlet allocation LDA, which uses a generative probabilistic model where each document consists of a combination of several topics and each term or word can be assigned to a specific topic. This is similar to PLSI-based model probabilistic LSI. Each latent topic contains a Dirichlet prior over them in the case of LDA. The math behind in this technique is pretty involved, so I will try to summarize it without boring you with a lot of details. I recommend readers to go through this excellent talk by Christine Doig. The black box in the above figure represents the core algorithm that makes use of the previously mentioned parameters to extract K topics from M documents. The following steps give a simplistic explanation of what happens in the algorithm behind the scenes. Okay, one, initialize the necessary parameters to for each document random initialize each word to one of the K topics. Three, start an iterative process as follows and repeat it several times. For for each document D, for each document, for each word W in the document, for each topic T, compute probability T D, which is the proportion of words D assigned to the topic T, uh, compute P W T, which is the proportion of assignments to the topic T over all documents having word B W, B assigned word W with topic T pro with probability. Multiplication considering, considering all other words and their topic assignments. Once this runs for several iterations, we should have topic mixtures for each document and then generate the constituents of each topic from the terms that point to that topic. Frameworks like Gensum or Scikit-Learn enable us to leverage the LDA model for generating topics. For the purpose of feature engineering which is the intent of this article, you need to remember that when LDA is applied on a document term matrix TFIDF or bag of words feature matrix, it gets decomposed into two main components. A document topic matrix, which would be the feature matrix we are looking for. A topic term matrix, which helps us in looking at potential topics in the corpus. Okay, and topic one, topic two, topic three, and you see the uh, topic one is sky with most value, and the topic two is bacon with most value, and the topic three is brown with most value. Okay, since these are very uh, uh, micro documents they are not very uh, useful to test such uh, huge models thus you can clearly see the three topics are quite distinguishable from each other based on their constituent terms first one talking about weather second one about food and the last one about animals choosing the number of topics for topic modeling is an entire topic on its own pun not intended and is an art as well as a science there are various methods and heuristics to get the optimal number of topics but due to the detailed nature of these techniques, we don't discuss them here. Document clustering with topic model features We used our bag of words model based features to build out topic model based features using LDA. We can now actually leverage the document term matrix we obtained and use an unsupervised clustering algorithm to try and group our documents similar to what we did earlier with our similarity features. We will use a very popular partition-based clustering method this time, K means clustering to cluster or group these documents based on their topic model feature representations. In K means clustering, we have an input parameter K, which specifies the number of clusters it will output using the document features. This clustering method is a centroid-based clustering method, where it tries to cluster these documents into clusters of equal variance. 
It tries to create these clusters by minimizing the within cluster sum of squares measure, also known as inertia. There are multiple ways to select the optimal value of k like using the sum of squared errors metric, silhouette coefficients and the elbow method. Okay. Future scope for advanced strategies. What we didn't cover in this article are several advanced strategies around feature engineering for text data which have recently come into prominence. This includes leveraging deep learning based models to obtain word embeddings. We will take a deep dive into such models in the next part of this series and cover popular word embedding models like Word 2 VEC and Glove with detailed hands on examples so stay tuned. Okay. Conclusion These examples should give you a good idea about popular strategies for feature engineering on text data. Do remember that these are traditional strategies based on concepts from mathematics, information retrieval and natural language processing. Hence these tried and tested methods over time have proven to be successful in a wide variety of datasets and problems. Next up will be detailed strategies on leveraging deep learning models for feature engineering on text data. I wonder if he has read an article about that. Oh, they have so much followers. Mm -hmm. Wow, so many, so many articles. Let's check only this guy. Here. Mm. Yeah, he has written some more articles. Okay, so the articles of this uh, developer is extremely useful. Uh, you should read them at home if you have a time. Okay, let's continue to our uh, slides. I think we have added that source to our um, slides. Okay, yes. So, how is an image represented? Images are made up of pixels. For a color image, each pixel corresponds to an RGB value, i.e. three numbers. Image features. For each pixel. Uh, there is RGB values between 0 and uh, 255. Do we retain all the information in the original document? Other features for images? Lots of image features. 
use patches rather than pixels sort of like bigrams for text different color representations iel asterisk ab texture features ie responses to filters shape features so with just uh, keeping the pixels we don't keep the all features of images uh, therefore you have to also consider the other features such as these ones and let's continue with audio ray data how is audio data stored many different file formats but some notion of the frequency over time audio features so what are the audio features for example i am not expert in audio area and to get the features of an area you should have some expertise or you should get some help from experts frequencies represented in the data fft Frequencies over time, STFT, responses to wave patterns, wavelets. Beat. Timber. Energy. Zero crossings. Obtaining features. Very often requires some domain knowledge. As ML algorithm developers, we often have to trust the experts to identify and extract reasonable features. That said, it can be helpful to understand where the features are coming from. Current learning model Training data labeled examples Learn and model classifier is generating Pre-process training data. Uh, this is usually required because when you do pre-process the training data, you would obtain a better model. Also, uh, remember that you have to apply same uh, pre-processing methods, techniques to your uh, new on uh, trained data, new data when you are going to do a prediction. Like uh, if you are going to convert all letters into the small cases uh, then you have to convert your uh, NIV uh, document to small case as well so same uh, pre-processing is applied to both training and for testing or prediction outlier detection what is an outlier An example that is inconsistent with the other examples. What types of inconsistencies? Extreme feature values in one or more dimensions. Examples with the same feature values but different labels. Okay, this is also uh, an important thing to consider because, the, because this would degrade your um, accuracy a lot. Okay. So how do we fix that? We just remove the conflicting examples. Removing conflicting examples. Identify examples that have the same features but differing values. For some learning algorithms, this can cause issues, for example, not converging. In general, unsatisfying from a learning perspective. Can be a bit expensive computationally, examining all pairs, though faster approaches are available. How do we identify these? Removing extreme outliers. Throw out examples that have extreme values in one dimension. Throw out examples that are very far away from any other example. 
train a probabilistic model on the data and throw out very unlikely examples. This is an entire field of study by itself, often called outlier or anomaly detection. Quick statistics recap. What are the mean, standard deviation, and variance of data? Mean, average value, often written as mu. Variance, a measure of how much variation there is in the data. Calculated as. Standard deviation, square root of the variance, written as sigma. How can these help us with outliers? Okay, so there are some examples I have put to the uh, slides. So, variance example. So, let's say we have uh, 3, 4, 5, 5, 6, 7, 9. The uh, median of the data is uh, 5.57. And what is the variance of this? So, it is calculated like this. So, how do we calculate the median? I mean mean, not median, mean, they are different things. Uh, so, but first we uh, uh, sum them, like this. And how many values we have? Uh, seven. So, the mean is 5.57 so when how do you calculate the variance it is x so the uh, for every element uh, is as x and the uh, mean uh, we take their square we sum them and we divide them to number of elements so it is like this uh, 3 minus 5.57 equal to uh, minus 2.57 and square it it is uh, 6.647 uh, uh, and we calculate the others and then we sum them and we then divide them to 7 and we obtain the variance. The standard deviation is calculated as take the variance and take its square which is these ones and it is the average amount of the scores different from the mean gives a, gives a good idea of spread and then we have the okay so the variance is calculated like okay anyway if you uh, read this you will understand so the outlier det detection there is a standard deviation and for certain uh, deviation the there are certain amount of data if we know the data is distributed normally, i.e. via a normal, Gaussian distribution. Outliers in a single dimension. Examples in a single dimension that have values greater than, k sigma, can be discarded, for k greater than greater than 3. Even if the data isn't actually distributed normally, this is still often reasonable. Okay. Outliers in general. Calculate the centroid, center of the data. Calculate the average distance from center for all data. Calculate standard deviation and discard points too far away. Again, many, many other techniques for doing this. So, if uh, they, uh, the standard deviation, I mean, the, uh, if that data is uh, below minus 3 and above 3, we can discard them as being outliers after we have uh, calculated the standard deviation. Okay, for this example. Outliers for machine learning some good practices throw out conflicting examples
throw out any examples with obviously extreme feature values i.e. many, many standard deviations away. Check for erroneous feature values e.g. negative values for a feature that can only be positive. Let the learning algorithm, other pre-processing handle the rest. So far. Throw out outlier examples. Feature pruning, selection. Good features provide us information that helps us distinguish between labels. However, not all features are good. Feature pruning is the process of removing bad features. Feature selection is the process of selecting good features. What makes a bad feature and why would we have them in our data? bad features each of you are going to generate a feature for our data set pick five random binary numbers i've already labeled these examples and i have two features if we have a random feature i.e a feature with random binary values what is the probability that our feature perfectly predicts the label Okay, so there is label and fi probability is like this. So with uh, 1 over 32, we will perfectly uh, predict uh, this uh, data set. Okay. Is that the only way to get perfect prediction? Okay. Although these features perfectly correlate, predict the training data, they will generally not have any predictive power on the test set. So you see, when fi is 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, we perfectly predict uh, the label. The opposite is also true. When fi is 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and uh, it is still able to perfectly predict the label. However, these have no predictive data on the test set because this is uh, memorization. Okay. Is perfect correlation the only thing we need to worry about for random features? Any correlation, particularly any strong correlation, can affect performance. Okay, for example, here, in this example, the zero gets the zero label and the zero gets the one label therefore this is the uh, abnormal uh, example or data noisy features noisy features adding features can give us more information but not always determining if a feature is useful can be challenging for example for in here ml grade is completely noisy feature because it makes a uh, uh, memorization and prevents our generalization this is completely overtraining in this way because with every ml grade you are able to 100% uh, predict the uh, class however it is not it would not have any effect on test data because actually uh, ML grade has nothing to do with go for a write or not. Noisy features. These can be particularly problematic in problem areas where we automatically generate features. For example, for this case, we are automatically generating features because it's usually in text data you generate the features automatically because uh, there are being uh, tens of thousands of different words and millions of words in a corpus of size. Clinton said banana repeatedly last week on TV, banana, banana, banana. Okay, and... Ideas for removing noisy, random features. The expensive way. 
Split training data into train, dev. Train a model on all features, for each feature F. Train a model on all features, F. Compare performance of all versus all F on dev set. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that uh, when you take a single feature against all other features and make training, you can uh, see how that feature affects your performance. Remove all features where decrease in performance between all and all F is less than some constant. However, this is not po uh, usually possible or, let's say, applicable to the domains where there are thousands of or tens of thousands of features. For example, you are working on a Wikipedia article classification or clustering. You have hundreds of thousands of different words billions of uh, or millions of documents with billions of uh, words and such it is not doable to do one versus all however if you are if you have a, a feature data set like this there are uh, six fe uh, five feature and uh, one uh, class you can easily use this approach Feature ablation study issues, concerns? Removing noisy features. Binary features, remove, rare, features, i.e. features that only occur, or don't occur, a very small number of times. Real valued features, remove features that have low variance. In both cases, can either use thresholds, throw away lowest X percent, use development data, etc. Why? Some rules of thumb for the number of features. Be very careful in domains where the number of features greater than number of examples. The number of features approximately equals number of examples. The features are generated automatically. There is a chance of random features. For example, the text uh, processing is uh, a perfect fit for domains where the number of features may exceed your number of examples. Let's say you have 10, 10 documents and each document has 1000 words. Therefore, you would have a lot of features with very few number of examples and it would be very hard to uh, generate a model uh, from that data set. In most of these cases, features should be removed based on some domain knowledge, i.e. problem-specific knowledge. So far. 1. Throw out outlier examples 2. Remove noisy features 3. Pick good features. Feature selection. Let's look at the problem from the other direction, that is, what are good features? How can we pick, select them? Good features. A good feature correlates well with the label. How can we identify this? Training error, like for DT, correlation model, statistical test, probabilistic test. Training error feature selection. For each feature F. Calculate the training error if only feature F were used to pick the label. So this is uh, like you use only single feature uh, uh, to uh, pick the label. Let's say in this example, we are only taking terrain or unicycle type or weather or jacket or ML grade.
rank each feature by this value. Pick top K, top X percent, etc. Can use a development set to help pick K or X. By the way, if you follow this uh, approach, you have to use uh, and put cross validation. Otherwise, if you just calculate the training set error rate, ML grade would be the best feature because it would generate 100% success for the training set. However, when you split your uh, data set into the, uh, let's say, 10 parts and use 9, 90% uh, for training and 10% for testing, the ML grade feature would get zero success in testing because it would just it would have just memorized uh, the training set and it wouldn't learn anything from the training set okay it would be totally over training or memorization let's say if there's a difference Okay. What is overfitting? The word overfitting refers to a model that models the training data too well. Instead of learning the general distribution of the data, the model learns the expected output for every data point. Okay, so you see this is underfitting, this is desired, it is well uh, curved and it can predict the unseen data and this is overfitting. You see it only knows that data point however if you put a new data here for example let me show you what i mean it with um, image drawing okay for example if i happen to if i happen to uh, put a, a dot here and okay here I can say that it is, let's say this is the class 1 and this is 0, this is class 0, okay. If I put here, it is class 0, if I put here, it is class 1. However, on here, if I put here or here or here, I cannot know that. Because it only knows these data points, okay. If I put on here, it can only know that. However, if I put outside of here, it cannot know it, okay and on here it is not uh, fitted at all this is the same a memorizing the answers to a maths quiz instead of knowing the formulas because of this the model cannot generalize Everything is all good as long as you are in familiar territory, but as soon as you step outside, you're lost. Okay, this is a good picture to describe it. So you have memorized it, 2 multiply with 1 equal to, to uh, 42 multiply with 1 equal 42, 3 multiply with 2 is 6. However, when you get the question 7 multiply with 3, you know nothing because you didn't see it previously. You didn't memorize it. You you don't know how to multiply, and therefore you you give blue screen as shown here. So we don't want this. Okay. Uh, if we if we take the ML grade, we would just memorize. We wouldn't generalize or we wouldn't learn at all. The tricky part is that, at first glance, it may seem that your model is performing well because it has a very small error on the training data. However, as soon as you ask it to predict new data points, it will fail. How to detect overfitting As stated above, overfitting is characterized by the inability of the model to generalize. To test this ability, a simple method consists in splitting the dataset into two parts, the training set and the test set. 
When selecting models, you might want to split the dataset in three, I explain why here. The training set represents about 80% of the available data, and is used to train the model, you don't say. The test set consists of the remaining 20% of the dataset, and is used to test the accuracy of the model on data it has never seen before. With this split we can check the performance of the model on each set to gain insight on how the training process is going, and spot overfitting when it happens. This table shows the different cases. Low training error, low testing error, the model is learning, high testing error, low training error, overfitting, high training error, high uh, low testing error, probably some error in your code or you have created a physics AI, and high testing error, high training error, the model is not learning. Note, for this technique to work, you need to make sure both parts are representative of your data. A good practice is to shuffle the order of the dataset before splitting. Overfitting can be pretty discouraging because it raises your hopes just before brutally crushing them. Fortunately, there are a few tricks to prevent it from happening. Okay, and... Okay, let's read this as well. How to prevent overfitting, model and data. First, we can try to look at the components of our system to find solutions. This means changing data we are using, or which model. Gather more data. You model can only store so much information. This means that the more training data you feed it, the less likely it is to overfit. The reason is that, as you add more data, the model becomes unable to overfit all the samples, and is forced to generalize to make progress. Collecting more examples should be the first step in every data science task, as more data will result in an increased accuracy of the model, while reducing the chance of overfitting. You see, as the data set size increases, the testing error and the training error uh, decreases because the overfitting also decreases. Okay. Data augmentation and noise. Collecting more data is a tedious and expensive process. If you can't do it, you should try to make your data appear as if it was more diverse. To do that, use data augmentation techniques so that each time a sample is processed by the model, it's slightly different from the previous time. This will make it harder for the model to learn parameters for each sample. Learn parameters for each sample means memorization, okay. We just, we want generalization, we don't want our model to learn samples. Another good practice is to add noise. To the input, this serves the same purpose as data augmentation, but will also work toward making the model robust to natural perturbations it could encounter in the wild. To the output, again, this will make the training more diversified. Note, in both cases, you need to make sure that the magnitude of the noise is not too great. Otherwise, you could end up respectively drowning the information of the input in the noise, or make the output incorrect. Both will hinder the training process. Okay, three. Simplify the model. If, even with all the data you now have, your model still manages to overfit your training dataset, it may be that the model is too powerful. You could then try to reduce the complexity of the model. As stated previously, a model can only overfit that much data. By progressively reducing its complexity, hash of estimators in a random forest, hash of parameters in a neural network etc., you can make the model simple enough that it doesn't overfit, but complex enough to learn from your data. To do that, it's convenient to look at the error on both datasets depending on the model complexity. This also has the advantage of making the model lighter, train faster and run faster. How to prevent overfitting, training process. A second possibility is to change the way the training is done. This includes altering the loss function, or the way the model functions during training. 
early termination. In most cases, the model starts by learning a correct distribution of the data, and, at some point, starts to overfit the data. By identifying the moment where this shift occurs, you can stop the learning process before the overfitting happens. As before, this is done by looking at the training error over time. How to prevent overfitting, regularization. Regularization is a process of constraining the learning of the model to reduce overfitting. It can take many different forms, and we will see a couple of them. By the way, this regularization is extremely important and useful. I have used in it in my uh, master, uh, in my doc, uh, PhD thesis. It significantly improves your performance. L1 and L2 regularization. One of the most powerful and well-known technique of regularization is to add a penalty to the loss function. The most common are called L1 and L2. The L1 penalty aims to minimize the absolute value of the weights. The L2 penalty aims to minimize the squared magnitude of the weights. I think L2 was uh, better for my cases. With the penalty, the model is forced to make compromises on its weights, as it can no longer make them arbitrarily large. This makes the model more general, which helps combat overfitting. The L1 penalty has the added advantage that it enforces feature selection, which means that it has a tendency to set to zero the less useful parameters. This helps identify the most relevant features in a dataset. The downside is that it is often not as computationally efficient as the L2 penalty. Here is what the weight matrices would look like. Note how the L1 matrix is sparse with many zeros, and the L2 matrix has slightly smaller weights. Okay, baseline and one regularization and L2 regularization. Another possibility is to add noise to the parameters during the training, which helps generalization. For deep learning, dropout and drop connect. This extremely effective technique is specific to deep learning, as it relies on the fact that neural networks process the information from one layer to the next. The idea is to randomly deactivate either neurons dropout or connections drop connect during the training. Okay, so this is the standard neural network and this is after applying dropout. You see some connections are removed. This forces the network to become redundant as it can no longer rely on specific neurons or connections to extract specific features. Once the training is done, all neurons and connections are restored. It has been shown that this technique is somewhat equivalent to having an ensemble approach, which favorizes generalization, thus reducing overfitting. Conclusion As you know by now, overfitting is one of the main issues the data scientist has to face. It can be a real pain to deal with if you don't know how to stop it. With the techniques presented in this article, you should now be able to prevent your models from cheating the learning process and get the results you deserve. I think this article is pretty well written. It has also some quite number of reads. And let's add it to our uh, slide. Okay. Okay, let's add it to here. Okay. okay, let's continue. So far.
1. Throw out outlier examples 2. Remove noisy features 3. Pick good features. Feature selection. Let's look at the problem from the other direction, that is, selecting good features. What are good features? How can we pick, select them? Good features. A good feature correlates well with the label. How can we identify this? Training error, like for DT, correlation model, statistical test, probabilistic test. Training error feature selection. For each feature F. Calculate the training error if only feature F were used to pick the label. Rank each feature by this value, pick top K, top X percent, etc. can use a development set to help pick K or X. Okay, feature normalization. Feature normalization. Would our three classifiers, DT, KNN, and Perceptron, learn the same models on these two data sets? Okay, so the KNN is and Perceptron are depending on the uh, numerical uh, weight of the features. Therefore, they would have hard time uh, to model uh, these data sets because the length parameter is uh, pretty big in this one. And there are also some significant differences. For example, color can be 0 and 1, and weight can be 8 up to, or uh, length can be 70 here. However, for a uh, decision tree, it wouldn't be a problem. Therefore, we should do uh, probably uh, min max normalization or perhaps standard deviation normalization. Decision trees don't care about scale, so they'd learn the same tree. KNN, no. The distances are biased based on feature magnitude. Uh, it's the same for usually for uh, neural networks as well. Which of the two examples are closest to the first? So if we don't make a normalization, okay, let's see them. So the apple gets uh, square 10 and banana gets square 17 and on this one the apple gets uh, square uh, 901 and the banana gets uh, square uh, 416. You see this apple is has more distance uh, to this apple than this banana. Therefore you see when we don't make scaling uh, the banana and apple becomes closer than apple than apple. Okay. Perceptron, no. Perceptron, no. The classification and weight update are based on the magnitude of the feature value. Geometric view of perceptron update. For each y, y equals y plus fi asterisk label. Geometrically, the perceptron update rule is equivalent to adding the weight vector and the feature vector. Example weights and new weights, as can be seen here. Example weights, example weights, same F1 value but larger F2 value. If the feature's dimensions differ in scale, it can bias the update. So we would accept, uh, expect the same kind of update. However, here uh, it is getting updated more because the magnitude is not scaled. Like here, it changes the direction as you can see. Different separating hyperplanes. The larger dimension becomes much more important. Okay, how to fix this? We can use um, uh, 
Center, adjust the values so that the mean of that feature is zero. How do we do this? Rescale, adjust feature values to avoid magnitude bias. Ideas. Okay, we have already seen this. Rescale, adjust feature values to avoid magnitude bias, variance scaling, divide each value by the STD dev absolute scaling, divide each value by the largest value data normalization greater than. So, there is also another data normalization here. And, okay, we have seen this. So, so far we have seen this and okay so now we have some uh, extra problem as well this banana is extremely different than the other ones this is an outlier make all examples roughly the same scale e.g make all have length equals one what is the length of this example vector it is like this, as you can see. Okay. Make all examples have length equals 1 divide each feature value by x. Prevents a single example from being too impactful. Equivalent to projecting each example onto a unit sphere. What about testing? Okay. When testing, you need to also pre-process pre your data. As you have pre-processed your data before training your model. Uh, therefore, they so that they would be uh, in the same format and same pre-processing. Then classify and do the prediction. How do we pre-process the test data? We do the same thing as uh, the training preprocessing. Which of these do we need to do on test data? Any issues? We have to do all Throw of out them. outlier examples too. Remove noisy features 3. Pick good features 4. Normalize feature values 1. Sender data 2. Scale data either variance or absolute 5. Normalize example length. Okay, this is the key point. Whatever you do on training, you have to do the exact same on testing. Okay, don't forget this. And uh, normalizing test data. Okay, I think this closes. To... Okay. Save these from training normalization. So you see the preprocessing function is same for training and testing. Features pre-processing summary. Many techniques for pre-processing data which will work well will depend on the data and the classifier try them out and evaluate how they affect performance on dev data make sure to do exact same pre-processing on train and test. Throw out outlier examples 2. Remove noisy features 3. Pick good features 4. Normalize feature values 1. Sender data 2. Scale data either variance or absolute 5. Normalize example length. Okay, this is the end of the lecture.